If I walk into a boardroom and there are another six me's, then I know that doesn't represent the community. And, uh, and it's what some people call, particularly my women friends call, male, pale and stale, which it can be because it is not reflective of, of uh, any of the stakeholders. The, the best performing businesses, the best performing boards, the best decisions being made are because of the diversity around the table. You'll have different conversations and it's not always going to be, you know, agreeing with everybody else, but it's being able to debate in a, in a respectful manner so that you can get all the issues out, hear from everybody and then make a collegiate uh, decision on which way forward. The gender imbalance remains stalled at the top levels of Australian businesses. According to the Australian Government's 2019 Workplace Gender Equality Scorecard, Female CEOs remained at around 17%, the same figure as in 2018. And female representation on boards only increased by one percentage point from 2018, now sitting at only 26.8%. So although conversations about gender equality are more common, leadership roles are not changing in the workplace. Most organisations are still headed up by male CEOs and run by largely male-dominated boards. Most managers at the highest level are also likely to be men, as only 39.4% of managers are women. And men are still paid more than women on average. What does this imbalance mean and what can we do to shift it? 20 years ago, I was asked, Donny, do you think we'll be having this conversation around women on boards and women in executive and whatever in 20 years time, 20 years ago? And I said, no. Now we're still having that conversation. We're having this conversation. Uh, so I hope that in 20 years time or less than 20, we're not. And I think the game changer is going to be men like Jim and other younger men coming through to say, oh, well, if you can't get me 50% of women on a shortlist or some true diversity, even young people on that shortlist, I'll get someone who can. So if men are saying it's going to be more powerful. I think that when you get people accustomed to the importance of diversity and the importance of inclusion, that is the only way that you're going to actually be able to bridge it. Because for most people, they just view it, oh, it doesn't matter, I pick the person that I think is best qualified for the job. Even though the person looks just like me and has the same kind of background. When they understand the kind of leapfrog in their company's ability or their federal agency's ability to innovate and to, to, to do the next level of whatever they do, that comes when you bring totally different ideas to the table. And when they understand the benefits and the bottom line dollars that, of improvement that they get in their company or organization, that comes from diversity. It won't be a thing that you kind of have to force. People will say, I want to make sure that I have a really diverse team on anything that I do. And, and when we get to that place, I think we'll be there. We've been working, particularly in business, in a system designed by males for males. So when I was at high school, women beyond the first couple of graded classes did typing and shorthand. So they're expected to go to the typing pool and we're expected to go to university and, and take the executive roles. I think a lot of males today are not feeling that as women come through and storm the boardrooms and are taking more than half the positions as they should. And I think there are a number of ways that we can hasten it. I mean, Australian Super, which is the largest superannuation fund in Australia, as this year said, 52 of the top 200 ASX listed companies have less than two women. So they're going to vote against any men that come up for election on any of those 52 boards until there are two women on those boards. Um, I think that's a good idea. I personally, and a lot of people don't, men and women, but I personally favour short term quotas. Again, just to get the job done. Uh, and then we can let nature take its course. I mean, in Bendigo Bank uh, recently, we uh, went to the market for a board role 
And we said, um, only females can apply. So I think we've got to signal that, it's, that the current system is unacceptable. Make sure that when you're recruiting someone for your organisation, whether it be an executive or board, that the headhunter, the recruiter or whoever's doing the role has at least 50% of the women on the shortlist to at least get them to the interview. It's up to the woman then to win from the interview. So, so there's some companies already that are stripping out any reference to uh, the gender within a CV to give women a fair chance at at least making it to the shortlist. The Australian Institute of Company Directors um, has, a, has a, a target of 30% of women on the top ASX 200. Now, we get, we get up to that 20, we've been 23, 25, 27, now we're slipping back. So I think uh, like the government in South Australia did over a decade ago with their targets was uh, 50% of women on boards and then if a woman leaves a board you have to replace that board member with another woman to make sure we not only get to the 30 percent but above. Um, equally don't forget particular boards that have mainly females or all females that's not good either so we're not just saying um, all male boards therefore put some females on look at the f all female boards and put some males on as well but I think a 40 60 is a good mix. If you talk to any of the professions, legal, accounting, there are probably more women coming into graduate programs than men. What we need to do now is hurry things up a bit in my generation. I am a passionate believer in equality of opportunity, but I'm not a believer in equality of outcome. Right, so my perspective is that every single person, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, should have equal opportunity. And I think that's what we should be aiming for. But I'm not a believer in equality of outcome because I think that you can't, you can't optimise for equality of outcome. You need to be focused on making sure that the opportunity is there. And I want to make sure that my daughters, just as much as my son, have the same opportunities. So you mentioned not believing in equality of outcome. What exactly do you mean by that? Um, I mean quotas. So, so from my perspective, I'm a big believer in diversity. I think as a business leader, I, you want as much diversity in your workplace as possible. Diversity of thinking and gender is a, a, an okay proxy for diversity of thinking. It's not the best proxy for diversity of thinking, but it's the best we've got. So yes, I think we want diversity in the workplace, but how we get there shouldn't be at the expense of another gender, you know, and I think that's the challenge. I think it'd be hard to find anybody on either side of the gender debate who wouldn't believe that everybody should have equal opportunity. If you look at it from a supply chain perspective, the reality is, is that more females enter universities than males on average in totality um, and more females graduate from university than males. That's just a fact. My problem with quotering is that you're actually artificially distorting based on the candidate pool. So if you say that there are 10 people looking at a particular role and five of them must be female and five of them must be men, um, but let's say that the graduation rates for that particular field are 20% to 80%, um, that's actually where it should be represented. And so it's easy to say, well, we quote her at that level, but the best person still gets the job. Um, but you're actually artificially distorting the outcome based on loading the dice. The only area of society where I think quotas actually make sense is in politics. So ultimately we live in a representative democracy and so ultimately our parliament should be roughly representative of the demographics of our society. And so um, if there was an argument for quotas, there should be an argument for quotas in politics from a representation standpoint. There's a really interesting conversation that's come up through doing the interviews and that is around 
the fear of men who are missing out. Yeah, I think that's a really kind of unfortunate um, mentality and that comes from the insecurities that are there for, for someone to kind of feel like just because a woman's here and she beats me out it's because she's getting it because she's a woman. And it really should be about who's qualified for this position and it should be about building the most diverse team that you possibly can so that you can get the results of what the organization was established for from the very beginning. So I mean, there are a lot of those kind of things that, that are involved in this dialogue. You have to address it head on and have those conversations. Whether to use quotas or not, to help achieve diversity in board appointments and senior leadership positions is only one of a number of complex and intertwined issues that impact the number of females in these roles. Another issue that was frequently mentioned by our advocates is the stereotypical expectation of family roles for men and women that are still prevalent today. I think for any parent, you know, whether you're female or male, um, having children while they're trying to expand a business added another level of complexity. There's been some interesting things when uh, I moved to the US, our daughter um, Zali was in year 12. Um, and we decided because of that, that we wouldn't move the whole family. So my husband, Jake, became the primary carer. But unfortunately, some things happened with comments from teachers that I should not have gone away. And in fact, the word bad mother was used. And so in the professional sense, we've made good strides in terms of equality. But until we actually address what happens in the social setting, we're really not going to get the type of change that we're hoping for and expecting. In 1989, I made that bold move and I went home to my husband and family and said, guys, we've got an opportunity to move to South Australia. We migrated from Melbourne to do exactly what we love doing, which me selling and my husband fixing photocopiers. What advice would you give to, you know, men and women in business who may feel challenged by gender stereotypes, who may feel limited by them? You know, how do you think we should approach them? My, my approach is forget gender, really and truly forget it. When Michael and I got married, or even when we got engaged, I wasn't in sales at that time. I was uh, the, the PA to the branch manager of that business that we were working for, and I was sales support. So that to the sales team. And that's how, you know, I guess um, I naturally started doing things uh, in my own initiative that my manager saw that, hang on a minute, this girl really understands sales. And there were no females in that team whatsoever. And I remember coming back from a honeymoon and I went and sat down with my manager and I said, Rob, I think I'd like to try sales. Would you be able to provide me the opportunity? He looked up, said, my God, girl, I've been waiting two years for you to say that. <laughs> And the interesting part of that story for me, I mean, there's so much in there, but it was your husband so and yeah. then your manager, both males, yes. who encouraged you at a time yeah. when there were women who were being That's told they had to exactly. stop working yeah. when they got married. Yeah. When I went into sales, I just did the things that made them think, hang on, I think we better pay a bit of attention to her. I think she's pretty damn good and I think we should just respect her for what she does. And when I left that company 13 years later, they were all in tears. What I would like to say, male or female, believe in yourself. You're the only one who can put a ceiling on your capabilities. No one else. No one else puts a ceiling on it. No one puts a gun to your head to say, stop, that's all you can be. There will be falls along the way, right? But if you have got and surround yourself with people that believe in you, they will help you pick yourself up and get moving again. When looking at how to get more women on boards, it's useful to look at what are some of the personal challenges that women in the workplace need to overcome and how can we help them achieve this?
There's no one answer and no one magic bullet, but I developed um, earlier on this year for International Women's Day what I called the no confidence will and what we could do to turn that around to be our brilliant self. And what, what I developed it from was what did men and what are they doing really well and what puts them in front of being chosen for promotions and board opportunities and women aren't. So what we need to do is get women to understand the power of networking. More than once I've had the conversation with women that go something like this. Do you know Rob Chapman? Yes, I do. Well, why don't you have a coffee with him? Well, I'm not sure I know him that well. Well, how well do you know him? Well, our kids go to the same school. Uh, we've been to his house for dinner five times. Uh, we're in a lunch group together. Um, well, you don't think that's well enough to ring and have a cup of coffee? Or, or do you think so? So men would uh, have only need, needed to be in the same airport as Rob to say, yeah, I know Rob Chapman, I'll give him a ring. Another thing is, and it's a big thing, um, but the imposter syndrome. That really holds women back from probably taking more risks uh, and, and because they don't think they're good enough. And even if a, a person says, I want you to go for this position or this ball position, they'll come up with all of the excuses of why they're not ready or why they shouldn't go for it, rather than think of all the positive things on why they should. And, and you know the old story about uh, there's a 10 criteria that you have to meet to go for a promotion and the men will look at it and go, oh, I've got four or six out of 10 of those, I'm going to give it a crack. And the woman's going, oh, I've only got eight or nine, I really haven't got the 10, so I'll just do more education, more training, and then I'll go for it. And then they regret it. So, so it's, 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 why don't women just have that mindset of, I'll give it a crack? Another thing is uh, they don't ask for help, thinking I can do it all on my own. And I tell you what, it's a lot easier when you not only ask for help, but when you accept help from others. So that's, that's another turnaround. And finally, we strive for perfection. And instead of striving for perfection, I think we need to strive for progress. Let, let's progress towards something that we want to achieve rather than make sure it's perfect. And it wasn't until I started behind closed doors because I thought I do, I do have a passion to get more women into executive roles and board roles. And I thought the best way that I could do that uh, was to get women who were already demonstrating they're supporting other women around a table with no other agenda than to see you the most successful you could be and to achieve what you want to achieve. So yeah, I just think if, if, we, if we have the tough love conversations, if we have the encouragement and the support, and it's consistent, that's important, and it's consistent, it's genuine, I think you'll just see a change. The reason I set up Behind Closed Doors was because I didn't want other women going through what I went through in coming up through into senior management in banking. So there were no role models for me. So I made a lot of mistakes because we didn't have coaches or mentors. We didn't have anything like behind closed doors. And what I'm trying to do is get women who want paid boards and ASX boards, train and educate you along with the Australian Institute of Company Directors to keep you learning and keep you relevant so that if you have the choice that you want to be on a board, that you get the opportunity. So it's really around opportunity. And there are so many board ready, ready women out there now. Probably 10, 15 years ago, there was a shortage of available women for the sort of roles that, that are there. Not anymore. The Peterson Institute for International Economics completed a survey of 21,980 firms from 91 countries and found that having women at the C-suite level significantly increases net profit margins. As discussed by our advocates in this episode, we know that diversity in management leads to better business performance. Yet knowing this and turning this into an increased rate of change for higher female representation in these roles has not yet been achieved. At the moment, most of the discussion about gender equality, 
parent leave, flexible work and caring or childcare issues is driven by women. Yet this isn't just a woman's problem. If senior management in more Australian companies recognised and discussed this more, we would start to see bigger shifts in the equity scorecard. Join us in episode three, where we take a look at female representation in the field of science. We speak to a number of women and men who are working to increase the current underrepresentation of women in this industry and why they believe it's critical that we do so. To stay connected and informed as we roll out this series, please like us on our Facebook page and you can re-watch any episode either via our website or on the Channel 44 website.